Yeah, I remember the first moment when I got the phone call that I actually got the job to head up the art department for episode one. And it completely stunned me and I was shocked because I knew I would have to attempt to fill Ralph's shoes. And it was horrifying. Horrifying in the sense that I knew it couldn't be done. That, you know, that there was no way that I could do that. And so I went in with the approach that maybe I'll not disappoint the fans. I'll just, you know, be able to do enough. But what drove me really was the idea that I didn't want to disappoint Ralph. I didn't want to let down his legacy because he had created such an amazing body of work that inspired generations, you know, myself included, that I really strove to just maintain that because I felt it was very important. I mean, I was not trying to fill his shoes. I was really trying to just, you know, keep it up and just do my part and contribute to the world of Star Wars. Yeah, I got a call from Doug and uh, he hired me to be a concept artist on episode one. Wow, <laughs> that was amazing. That's a call I had been waiting all my life. And um, it was fantastic. I wish many of the other young artists out there could have felt what I felt inside when I first walked on the third floor at the Skywalker Ranch and look and gaze upon all the maquettes and drawings and sketches and concept art that just blew me away. It was fantastic. Um, it was a direct inspiration from Ralph's artwork, obviously. One of the amazing things was I had a chance to go and look at all the unused artwork that Ralph had done. And it was amazing because I realized at that point that Ralph had really already designed the prequels. There were so many unused designs that all the worlds that George was having us work on were already touched in some way by Ralph. And it was an incredible leg up. I mean, I could go in there and if I would get a mental block where I couldn't figure out, okay, what does Utapau look like? What does Nebu look like? I could go in there and I would actually find an original old Ralph, you know, from 15 years ago of his first stab at that. And that became the foundation of what I started to build the designs on. And the other great thing was, you know, because Ralph was really trying to visualize where George was, um, George's world, George could see those original drawings and what I was bringing to it, and then actually push me in another direction. And those little pushes were actually the ones that actually enabled me to try to create something that was maybe a little bit, you know, what Ralph would do, the next step. And it was a great way to work because if I got stuck, I'd always think, okay, well, what would Ralph do here? You know, how would he tackle this? How would he design this? And immediately, images would come to my mind of what I would do. So that worked beautifully for, you know, the worlds that Ralph had already worked on. In other cases where George had worlds that, you know, were completely unique to uh, the prequels, I kind of used the same trick. You know, I thought, okay, well, you know, I'm stuck, but what would Ralph do? And that almost always gave me an idea. The key part is really the idea and the blue sky thinking about it. And that's what Ralph's legacy really boils down to. It's the uncanny ability to look at a frame, a blank piece of paper, and asking yourself, what am I going to fill this with? Where am I going? I mean, there were many concepts that Ralph had created that um, were unused for the original films. And one of them was the flying whale. And I remember when I went down to the archives and I saw these images, I mean, there are hundreds that were just stunning. But there was something very unique about this flying whale where I thought, wow, God, you know, we have to try to bring this back because it was a, a visual icon that was just stunning. I mean, no one had ever seen it before. And so when George, you know, for episode two, uh, and ap actually episode one, you know, said that we're going to create this water world, you know, and I thought, wow, maybe this is the perfect opportunity to try to bring back some of these designs that Ralph had and make it work for this planet. And for episode one, we actually tried. We, we tried to put the flying whales in, you know, in the sequence with this air battle with the staps. Unfortunately, because of time constraints, you know, that was cut. But fortunately, we were able to bring it in for episode two. And it's one of those really rewarding things where, you know, I never had a chance to ask Ralph, you know, how he thought about that. But I, it was my way to pay tribute to him because I thought, you know, the designs we were creating were so amazing. I had to try, you know, some way to get him into the film later on. And that was one that actually worked out really well. Before Star Wars, I don't know that I had even focused on the idea of concept art. Uh, or knew what a concept artist did. I know there were lots of people out there doing 
other kinds of things, but except for Ralph and maybe Sid Mead at the time, it was a, a, a whole foreign subject to me. And yet I saw that they were having a problem marketing Star Wars. Fox didn't know how to sell it. Um, the special effects shots hadn't been finished. And so they started using a lot of Ralph's concept paintings uh, in advance to help market the movie. And there's a reason for that, because it, it wasn't that Ralph was such a great artist, which he was. It was that Ralph was a storyteller, that every one of his paintings told a story. And now, you may not have known exactly what the details of that story were, but you were still drawn in and you wanted to know what that story was. And that really did help them sell the movie because art, in this case, is commercial as well as fine art. And Ralph had that ability and that talent to combine both. The fact is, Ralph's work has certainly you know, withstood the test of time. I mean, we're only 35 years or so away from some of his initial work, but the work has been used and reused and, and keeps exciting generations of Star Wars fans. Um, it, it, originally, it was, it was, there was some of Ralph's work on posters. We certainly know about the publishing and the impact on that. Um, occasionally, there would be some product, much more so today, because it's the kids who grew up knowing Ralph's artwork, seeing it in the portfolios, who are familiar with him again, um, that, we, that we see some of the, the tie-in to that. Uh, Hasbro. Uh, has used Ralph's concept work for figures as far back as the 19, late 1990s when they, when they first did an air speeder pilot, which was the very first time they'd ever done anything outside the realm of the characters that we all knew from the movies. This was concept art and they sold it as that. And then a few years ago, they did an entire line of Ralph McQuarrie's signature uh, action figures and some vehicles too. And so even the stuff that you didn't see or the stuff that wasn't on the screen or the stuff that started out as a sketch that big you know, has become just used in, in Star Wars in some way or other. I saw his work, it was fantastic, it was really beautiful, and uh, met him, he was a very sweet guy, easy to get along with, and with a combination of those things, I said, let's go.